Association at COP15, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Rachel Vallander, and I'm Director of External Engagement and Partnerships for COP15. Bonjour à tous. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Pavillon de Canada à la COP15. Oh, COP15. Et merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Je m'appelle Rachel Vallander. Je suis la directrice d'engagement externe et partenariat pour COP15. C'est avec plaisir que je, prevente, je vous présente notre prochain événement. À l'écoute des oiseaux, commandent les organisations autochtones coproduisent des études acoustiques pour informer la conservation et l'entendance, organisées par Seal River Watershed Alliance. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our next event, Listening to the Birds, how Indigenous organizations are co-producing acoustic research to inform conservation and stewardship, hosted by the Seal River Watershed Alliance. This event will be hosted by Stephanie Thrassi. Stephanie is a land advocate and executive director of the Seal River Watershed Initiative, an initiative led by the Saisi Dene First Nation to protect the entirety of the Seal River watershed for a future generations in partnership with their Cree, Dene, and Inuit neighbors. A proud member of the Saisi Dene First Nation, Stephanie is also a mother, hide tanner, caribou eater, esthetician, award-winning makeup artist, jewelry creator, vegetable gardener, and dog lover. So uh, please welcome me in joining Stephanie. Hello, hello. Masicho, what's here? Stephanie Thrasi Hushe. Good morning, everybody. Um, so happy to be here and very honored to share um, and celebrate with you some of the work that we've done the past two years with our friends at the National Audubon Society. Um, you know, it's kind of um, almost, it's not a fluke, it's more like fate how this partnership kind of developed because our founder, Ernie Buzzador, his indigenous name, his Dene name is actually an owl. And my Dene name is actually a chickadee. So uh, it's a real um, combination of uh, the love for birds here as we sit here and uh, talk about some of the work that we've done so far this year. So before we embark on a journey listening to our birds, uh, let us start by listening to a song by my people. So as I said earlier, I'm really here to celebrate with you to kind of share some of the really incredible stuff that we've done. It is my last presentation here at COP15. This is probably number 10 for me, but um, it's, it's almost the best for last because really we can talk about some of the people on the land, the youth on the land, the community members that are out there doing this work that's so, so important. Uh, here you can see um, our, our, our sign that's in the heart of the watershed that we put up this past year, uh, it's really special. It's signifying the work that we're doing is real and, and it means so much to us for so many reasons. So on this map here, you can see general Canada and the green dot is my community. It's the heart of the watershed. It's Tadouli Lake, Manitoba. So. Where you see the green dot, there are no roads to get there. There is, um, we're isolated, and it's always kind of been that way because of how remote we are and how far it is to get to. We've been able to really uh, have this little piece of land um, 
be saved for us and be, be um, it's technically 99.97% pristine. So the lands and the waters and the, the area that we see, the boreal, it's nearly perfect. There are no industry, there's no development, there's no hydro in this area. And so because of that, this area that we call home is a, a perfect place for our bird friends to come and, and summer with us. This is the area of land that we are working so hard to protect. Um, two days ago, we were able to make an announcement with our friends uh, the federal government and the province of Manitoba that we are going to be starting a feasibility study to uh, create this protected area. Now, as you can see, it's a very large piece of land. It's the same size as Costa Rica or Nova Scotia. Now, this area that you see on the map, it is a fully intact watershed. So every single part of that watershed is the same as it's been since my great-great-grandparents used to be nomadic and follow the caribou there. So it's a really special place that uh, we work with our friends and our neighbors to protect. Because it's such a large area of land, we honor and recognize that the territory that we share with our neighbors, uh, traditional territory, overlaps. And so we have partnered officially with uh, Northlands Dennis Suhlina First Nation, Barrenlands First Nation, and Opipana Piwin Cree Nation. So we've created an alliance. And this is the work that we are doing, is to really try to protect this area. As you can see, it's a beautiful landscape and a beautiful territory. Um, we, we really are working so hard to really steward this land based on our traditional laws that have governed us on the land, on the land since uh, time immemorial. It's really something you hear a lot, right? But I don't know how else to explain to you that my nation has been there since before science was created and before the universities were established and before these cities that we're sitting in uh, were officially established. Like the lands that have been here have been occupied by our indigenous communities since before we could record the time. So the reason that we are really here today is to talk about some of the work that we've done and some of the monitoring work that we've done. You know, this is the first real project that our, pro that our community and our alliance has been able to partake in um, that has paired it with the Western science, with our indigenous knowledge, where we are honoring our knowledge first. So we have this beautiful collaboration where uh, we've had the Audubon Society come and and say we wanted to do this monitoring work. And they literally um, left it up to us to do the work, to establish where the recording units were going to go, how we were gonna set them up. There were no um, huge lists of regulations and rules and saying you have to do it this way, it needs to be at this height and it needs to be facing the north side or, or all of these kind of rules, right? We, we were really able to go to our elders and talk to them about what areas do you see the most importance in putting up these units? And the first year was kind of a pilot project. It was, uh, it was, so we kind of were closer to home the first year that we were able to put this stuff up. The second year we've put up even more units, which is really, has been really exciting because we, we're starting to get even more information on these recording units. Um, and here you see an Arctic turn in the photo, right Jeff? Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, but the reason I had mentioned the Arctic turn is because we're re we're hearing that the the migration route of those birds is actually super super far. It and for us in the community, you know, you kind of take it take that for granted in learning that a lot of these birds are coming from a very far place to summer with us in this pristine land and. For us, it's just normal, right? These are, the, these are the birds that have always kind of been in our backyards. And it kind of puts that, um, shines a spotlight on our home and helps us to really think of it in a more uh, global level. 
which has been really cool for us, you know, because most of us were sit sitting there going, oh, wow, I never realized that they traveled this far. I never realized that they fly this many kilometers to be with us. And, and it's um, helped us to kind of see in a science way uh, some of the things that you all have been celebrating for a long time, right? So this here is at the mouth of the estuary, at the mouth of the river that goes into the Hudson's Bay. So our, the watershed also flows into that area and we have even more um, coastal birds that are there as well. So it's a really beautiful place to be. I was able to really um, celebrate being there this summer. Uh, one of the partnerships and projects that we were, did was we were able to go out in canoes with 18 of our staff members. Uh, we canoed for seven days out to the mouth of the Seal River. And at this place, we were able to install some more units. So we're excited to be able to go now um, to pick, pick them up because the territory where we live in, uh, when the units have to go out, there's always ice on the water and there's it's dangerous to travel and it's really hard to get there. So typically we have to put out the bird units in the winter and then we go and pick them up in the summer uh, on boats. So it's usually a big ordeal and it's lots to think about when we're planning uh, uh, to set them up. But it's it's been so exciting though. The Seal River watershed is a pristine place that encompasses 50,000 square kilometers in northern Manitoba. We've always known that there's an abundance of birds in the watershed. You hear the birds in the morning and in the evening squawking at you and, and laughing at you. So in 2020, Audubon Society approached us to help them with bird monitoring in the watershed. This automated recording unit is the Songmeter SM4. It has a little SD card in it that's recording. They're useful for scientists to learn more about the birds. By installing these, we know more about the birds and their migration routes. We know how far some of the birds are traveling to get to this pristine land. And we know more space that we need to protect. In the past, it's always been outsiders come in, not tell us what was going on, what was the significance of the work they were doing. We so appreciate being able to work together like this in partnership, letting us have say and control on how we're going to collect the information and sending out our own people to do the research out in our own backyards. So this year I mentioned to Jeff at Audubon that, you know, it'd be really amazing to get some more devices up in the watershed before the ice melts. We're hoping to get these to Northlands, Bearlands, to get even more recording happening. Working with Jeff Wells and the Audubon Society has been refreshing. They've been so open and understanding and really truly been allies to the work that we've been doing. Collecting this information really helps us make decisions on how we want to conserve and protect the watershed utilizing the indigenous knowledge, but also Western science to have two feet planted in the world. The opportunity to work together and partner. It's really exciting and it really does feel like it's a step in the right direction. Masicho. So um, next we have our friend Marshall Johnson from the National Audubon Society who's going to share a little bit about uh, some of the work that we've been doing as well. So I don't stand in or sit in front of the uh, video or the slideshow. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, it was so great. Stephanie joined last month our all staff uh, call for the National Audubon Society and she really uh, captivated our staff um, and inspired them with her knowledge and her courage that she, thank you, uh, and uh, 
her people are displaying in protection of the boreal forest. Uh, as as uh, Stephanie mentioned, I have the pleasure, honor of serving as the chief conservation officer for the Audubon Society. I shouldn't say national uh, when I'm outside of the country and really we're, we're really rethinking the way we work because we have to work where birds are across the hemisphere. Some birds there uh, that nest here in the boreal forest may travel 15 or 20,000 kilometers uh, to get home uh, to their nesting grounds. Um, for those that, of you that may or may not be aware, Audubon is a collection of, is this loud enough now? Uh, Audubon is a collection of nearly 2 million members, 600 campus and community chapters across the hemisphere, um, all working towards the prote protection of birds um, all across the Americas. Uh, we've been doing so for more than 117 uh, years now, um, which pales in comparison to how long the First Nations have pro been protecting this land. We often use the phrase, uh, birds tell us. Um, and for us, it's a declaration that what birds tell us through science actually matters. Um, the oral stories and observation and knowledge that have been passed down over the centuries by indigenous leaders and elders matters. Um, and we should listen to it. When we think about land use decisions, we should listen to what uh, traditional ecological knowledge and science tells us about landscapes like the boreal forests. Uh, we focus on efforts uh, on which birds tell us about the health of the environment, um, including which habitats are in the most need of protection. Bringing birds and other biodiversity back means that we must work across the entire flyways through which birds migrate from the far north in Canada to the tip of Chile and Argentina. Um, we must work everywhere and uh, everywhere in between uh, those points and beyond. Uh, now, while birds tell are really the prism through which we view our work, uh, birds merely take us to the places and the special people that we work with. Um, the boreal far forest is really one of those uh, special places, worthy of urgent land protection efforts at a scale not seen before. Uh, it provides vital habitat for as many as three billion, nearly one half of North America's birds across nearly 400 species and is often rightly referred to as, the, as North America's bird nursery. That's why we were eager to expand our efforts uh, to include a specific uh, boreal songbird conservation strategy under the le leadership of Jeff, Jeff Wells and the team uh, within our Audubon Americas program. Uh, we recognize that indigenous governments and organizations are leading the most critical and, and ambitious efforts to preserve the boreal forests and associated watersheds like the Seal River. Our strategy includes using science uh, communications to collaborate with and support the leadership of indigenous governments and organizations in support of indigenous protected and conserved areas and indigenous guardians programs, which you'll hear about a little bit more across Canada. Uh, bird song recording uh, and monitoring projects are a great example of the work that we're trying to do, um, the capacity that we want to bring to help support these efforts. Uh, these co-produced research projects, as Stephanie alluded to, use automated recording units, our ARUs, to record the sounds of birds and other animals and wildlife, like uh, wolves. <laughs> uh, these devices are attached to trees in remote areas. Uh, and once deployed, allow for the ongoing collection of audio data from the surrounding landscape, including bird songs and calls. Uh, the data is later retrieved and analyzed to determine the presence of birds in that specific area. Uh, by relying on both the indigenous 
ecological, traditional ecological knowledge of elders and guardians, as well as the technology and science of more of uh, Western science, we're able to better understand the full picture of the abundance and diversity of bird species in a given area like the boreal forest. The data also helps us track changes over time. Um, here you can see, let's see, let's go back one hour forward. Here you can see uh, locations throughout the boreal for forest where these co-produced acoustic research projects are currently underway. Uh, now I want to turn it back over to Stephanie uh, to share experiences and explain how the hard work uh, that goes into this is making a difference, uh, particularly retrieving the ARUs. Stephanie? Thank you, Masicho. Um, so I'm going to skip this forward here. Here you see a photo of a young man. His name is Jordan Cutlup. He, um, so when we do these projects, we have to think about, um, right now we don't have the supplies to, or the, um, the vehicles to go and do all of this work, right? So we're just building up that, that capital, those capital assets for our work. So in the meantime, we have to do rentals, right? So we rent snowmobiles from local people. We have to rent the boats from local people. Um, we have to think about the fuel that it takes to go to travel to some of these places. So in my community alone, fuel is $3.10 per liter. So it's quite expensive to go anywhere, right? So um, that's one of, the, I guess, the perks of being isolated, right? <laughs> So this young man here, Jordan Cutlup, he was so excited. He had just started working with us. Um, so a lot of the projects we do, we get people on the land. We connect them with our elders. It's a part of some of the cultural work that we're doing. Uh, we're, th we're thinking about how to say some of the names of the birds in our languages. And we are really um, trying to incorporate that data with this science data that we're learning. So we, we got Jordan out here. We were putting up these 10 units with the snowmobiles. As you could see in the video, we were driving out. Uh, there was myself, Ernie Buzzador, our elder, and then Ronnie um, Moise, another elder, and then we had Jordan Cutlup. So he was so excited and he was just beaming. You could see the joy just radiating from him. and. I said, Jordan, when's the last time you've been out on the land like this, you know, and been able to to be out here in your own territory, right? And he says, Steph, it's been like 10 years. And I was like, are you serious? It's been 10 years? So I couldn't really, like, I, I was shocked. And, and for me, it was surprising, right? But I started to think about it. And in, in some of this work that we're doing, I'm starting to see that a lot of people, a lot of our young people, um, they don't see past the community store. They don't see past uh, what's kind of in their little bubble, some of them, right? Because it costs a lot to go out on a land. You need the right equipment. You need to be safe. You know, it's, it's a harsh territory out there. And if you're not careful, and if you don't have the right kind of knowledge that comes from our elders and our land users that are teaching us, uh, you could hurt yourself. You could, you could die out there, right? Quite literally. So... Um, this young man here, he was so, so, he and some of the others that we'll be talking about are the reasons why we're doing this, right? It's about those young people, getting them on the land and, and trying to get them connected again. So here we are again, we're out there. The snow was so, so high. It was crazy how high the snow was. Um, and we could see some tracks. You could see where uh, a moose had gone through in the snow and was disturbing, like making its path and the trails. And you can see our lovely trees. Aren't they uh, something spectacular? <laughs> we're very close to the tree line. So we don't have these huge tall trees but we're still so happy to have them because they heat our homes they help us build uh, log cabins previously in the past which was my first home was literally a 10 by 10 log cabin without electricity or without running water so here we are uh, this past summer 
uh, there were four boats that had gone out, and this isn't even all of us in the in the the group that had gone up to do the retrievals. So we have units that went out actually on the western side of the watershed that our Northland team were able to put out on that side. So um, there were five units that went out on the very far, this, so this was this past year, on the very far western side. And then we had 10 more units that went up kind of in and around um, different areas of the Tadouli Lake, right? So here we are, we're gone out to go and retrieve the units. Uh, I was running around busy trying to organize the, make sure we, everybody had fuel and, and, and the supplies that were needed and getting a pair of rubber boots for someone else who, who we brought in from the other communities, right? So here we have members from Barren Lands, Brochet, Northlands, Lac Brochet, Opipina Piwin, Cree Nation, uh, South Indian Lake, and Tadouli Lake. So we have four communities here together doing this work, which is which was so amazing and so incredible to have all four nations together doing this work simultaneously. And that kind of cooperation and collaboration with this work is so, so important because we get to hear from the different cultures and the different languages about this work and about the territory. We get to hear about how we're all networked and connected despite being from different languages and cultures. You get to hear how we're actually really related in other ways when we're like 100 kilometers apart and we're isolated and there's no roads between our communities other than say skidoo trails in the winter time, right? So it was really, really exciting. There was this energy in the air. We were out in the boats and the water was so rough. Um, it was kind of ridiculous how wavy it was when we were out in the boats. And we had to, so we ended up using um, GPS to mark all the units and this little like marking tape. And then we had to go back and we were going and collecting them following the units. But also like Ernie is just like, oh yeah, no, it's just it's on that side on the third point over there. And, and we're just like, we, we won't be able to find that based on that information. But he knew exactly where these units were, right? So we'd be going out in the boats and we'd slow down and we're going into New Gaza and we're picking up the units and they're like, oh, I see the marker. It's over there. Can you see it? Can you see it? And I'm literally squinting, and I'm like, I don't see it. Are you? I don't see it. We get closer and closer and closer. Sure enough, there it is, right? The, these are our young people and the, the land users and stuff. They're just so used to seeing um, the land, and they can see when something is out of place, right? And so they could just see these really little marking tape. I had a really hard time seeing it, and I'm 2020. So these guys are just used to that, right? So this here is Darren Yassi. He is one of our youth land guardians. Uh, he just turned 18. He was, so on our, on our canoe trip, he was one of the, the youth that uh, we did these intro to moving water courses with our staff to get them ready to paddle through white water because heading through, um, Paddling through rapids is not a traditional skill. When you think of surviving and thriving on the land, you avoid that, right? You go around it. You don't go for the most dangerous spot on the river and just for fun. If you're there to, sur to survive, you go around it. So we're trying to pair these two ideas together, these Western uh, techniques to paddle through uh, these kinds of waters so that we can hopefully in the future take on some ecotourism ideas where we can invite some of our friends down to experience uh, our backyard. So Darren had just learned how to lift a canoe by himself the week before we went out. Uh, he just learned how to carry it by himself, you know, and, and the following week while we were portaging and we were making our way back to Tadouli Lake, this young man literally was running through the bush uh, with the canoe on his back like speeding past all of us as we were moving all of our stuff, all of our gear. And it was, it's so, um, it makes us all really proud to see these young people um, owning it, you know, and being out there on the land and really excelling at something that they were born to do, right? That blood memory that exists in them. Like, 
we were told by our friends who had been doing the paddling with us, the training, that this portage would take about five hours. And because of our young people, our land users, it took us just over an hour to do this really heavy duty portage. And I thought, yeah, that's right. This is, we were nomadic. We used to move big camps, all of our people. We used to do this on a regular basis before, before um, people came and set, settled, right? So this was in our blood memory. Of course we were able to do it and do it really well. So it was really exciting to see and I was just sitting there like covered in sweat with a mosquito hat on and the sand flies were just killing us. And I was just sitting on the moss, like I was just beaming with pride because of how amazing these young people were, were showing like these Western science people, like that we could do this stuff and we could do it really well. This here is Savannah Tazazi. She is 17 years old. So there was a lot of snow when we put up those units in the wintertime and we couldn't reach it. So we actually ended up having to uh, hoist up Savannah to get the unit down. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, so, you know, that, that, those are factors that we have to think about is how much snow is falling and, and how, much, um, how much do we have to make adjustments for the, in the, for the following years, right? And, and it's always different. The snow levels are always changing where we are right now. It, I think that's a part of the climate change stuff that we're dealing with. But Savannah, last week, two weeks ago, I've been here for two weeks, three weeks ago, we were able to have our Land Guardians launch. We were able to partic participate and take our firearms licensing with all of our Land Guardians and our youth Land Guardians. It's very important to have this certification in our territory for safety, for harvesting. And this young person here, we were at this, this um, course, this training, and she's five foot three, five foot two, she's shy, she's quiet. She was there at this, this training that we were taking and um, the instructor comes around with this tray with all these different uh, rifle shells and asks us to identify them, right? And she knew all of them. She was picking them all out. She was paying attention, right? It was so cool to see that. And then when we had to do our tests, we did our practical tests and our written test. And this 17-year-old girl got the highest score out of everybody. She got the highest practical score out of everybody. You know, if that doesn't tell you um, the strength and the resiliency that exists in our people, but especially in these women that are coming up and are able, are going to be doing this work that I'm doing and taking over this work that we're doing, right? It's so exciting. Uh, and I really love telling that because it's another reason that we're so excited and we're really celebrating these young people that are really able to show up and, and, and show the world that like we can do this work. And that's, it, it fills me with so much pride, right? Because there was a time when our nations were moved we had to, um, we were accused of being bad stewards. And because of that, we were forcefully relocated. And uh, we know that we've been good stewards. We know that we've always existed in harmony with the lands, with our backyards. And these things that I'm celebrating with you and showing you, uh, it really does prove that those things, right? It really does uh, give us reasons to stand up tall and proud and say, no, we've known this since the beginning and we're going to keep being good stewards because this is a part of the indigenous laws that govern us as people. So here we are collecting some of the units. Um, it was really a celebration. It was so much fun. It was really exciting to be out there with the full team as I said earlier and I just want to show you some of like all of the work that goes into collecting these units. And then here we are, we were doing our canoe trip where we were out for seven days in the water. Um, it really, getting some of these, getting boats, getting snowmobiles and these kinds of things are really important to the work we're doing and part of like some of the tricky financing stuff that we have to think about and try to plan out because a lot of that isn't covered in some of the, the um, 
the funding proposals that we put in. But we're really excited that we were able to get some of these canoes for our trip to put up some of these units. We were able to put up uh, two more units at the end of the Shatani Esker, or the beginning of the Shatani Esker. So Shethnai means the, the hill that goes into the water. And so this Esker actually goes all the way up to Nunavut. Um, and Esker is a sand hill left over from the glaciers. They go for kilometers and miles and go on and on, and they are in the shape of rivers that used to be flowing underneath the, the, the glaciers. So these are really spectacular places, and the place that we, the last units that we need to collect this year are at the last known place where my nation used to build birch bark canoes. So it's a place where Samuel Hearn traveled through when he was going to discover the Northern Ocean. It's a place that you could see the tracks of the moose and the, the, you, can, you can tell that this is an ancient highway that the animals are using. You could, we could see the tenterings from the teepees and the, the cabins that used to be there. We found old like hide scraping tools there. And so there's all this evidence of our people thriving and existing in this area. And so uh, we thought, you know, we need to get, we need to get these units up here. We need, to, we need to see what we hear because there's so much evidence of so many different animals that use this air, area right before the Seal River Major starts. So uh, this is when we were on our way to go and put some of these units up. It was such a beautiful time out there on the land. And here are some of the units that we picked up. It was really fun uh, experience, experience and exercise. Our, one of our, uh, our elders, she was uh, helping us to come up with these names for some of these places where we, because uh, there's so many different bays, there's so many different areas. And at some of these areas, the rocks are really high. Or at one of these areas, our, one of the boats, they broke a paddle, you know? So it just helps us to remember uh, where we put some of these units when we're uh, classifying them and sending this data over to the Audubon Society. So I'm sure they're wondering, Broken Paddle Bay. Okay, I wonder what that means, you know? But this is the, this is the way, this is the traditional way that we name places, you know? There's a place that, um, where people used to travel from Tadouli Lake to Lac Brochet on snowmobile on this old skidoo trail. And my dad was so, so tired that he wrapped his arm around the tree branch and he leaned up there and he fell asleep there for a couple of minutes, right? And so my great uncle called that spot uh, Rogers, Rogers Island, right? Because he fell asleep on this tree there. And so then now when they talks about it with his, with his families and when they're traveling, they know where that spot is because that's Rogers Island, right? Because it's where he fell asleep on the tree. And this is traditional ways that we name places, right? So I thought I'd share that, this little story with you. And here's the end. This is when we finished our, our, our uh, seven days out canoeing. You can see everybody's really windburnt and really got two-tone colored faces because of the sunglasses. But it really was an uh, incredible time out there uh, trying to learn some of these Western science ideas that we, that we are um, on how to pack light and, and to eat different kind of food and, and, and comparing that to our traditional knowledge and trying to find a way that matches us, that works for us when we hopefully are able to do these tours in the future. Okay, I think I'm going to hand it over to my friend Jeff here to um, share a little bit of the data that we've collected. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I'm just going to just share some of the, the early results um, from some of the work. Um, and this is the uh, map of the watershed, the, the Seal River watershed again. And um, we're, we're going to zoom in. At, uh, in, the, in the middle of that is Tadouli Lake that, that Stephanie has talked about in, um, in 2021. Uh, it was around Tadouli Lake where the first set of ARUs were were put up. And um, we have worked with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology using some of their um, artificial intelligence algorithms to help um, 
go through these bird sounds more rapidly. When you have thousands and thousands of hours, of course, you can't just sit there and listen to them all, or it would, or it would take thousands of hours of sitting and listening. But um, So you have to find other ways to do it. And so we have some results here from that early, um, from, from some of the early pilot results that, um, that they helped us generate. Uh, for example, this map here, which just the, shows kind of the total species count. So the bigger the, bigger the circle, the, um, the more species that were at a particular place. And Tadouli Lake is the lake that's kind of the bigger lake down at the bottom there. So these are um, places that um, were put out um, along that area. Um, you know, you can, uh, again, do things like look at the, the species. This is just a matrix of the, the 10 um, locations, 10 units, and the spe some of the species from this initial um, run through the, the algorithm that came out. And just, I think I've highlighted in green some of the species that were most, most widespread there. But, you know, you can just basically see how you get an inventory of some of the species. This is one of a, a particular species, the fox sparrow. And um, you can see how um, there are particular spots where it occurred in, in that area. This is a little recording we'll try that was from one of the, the units. Let's see if it works. It's a little bit faint, but. Yep, with a northern water thrush intruding there, but. <laughs> Some other species, you know, the, again, for any one of these species, you can look at this, the, di the distribution and some measure of, of how common are, they are. And you, you know, with the bald eagle, we need to talk to Stephanie to find out why there's, they really like that one spot. Maybe there's a nest there, maybe it's a feeding area, I don't know. But we, um, that's the kind of thing where we have a back and forth with the community to find out what they know about why some of these species are, might be in this place or that place. Um, this, again, the northern water thrush, and I'll try playing the sound. This is from one of those recordings as well. There are loud birds, a, little, oh, some other, a few other things in there too, like loons and song sparrow in the background for the ones with good ears. Um, and all sorts of interesting things and lots of other species that, of course, we find on there as well. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to doing more with those as far as sharing them with the world. Um, Blackpole warbler, you know, a, a bird that makes this amazing migration and I wanted to put this one in here in particular. Um, it's often discussed as this great story of linkages across countries. Um, so these birds that are, are nesting in the Seal River watershed around Tuduli Lake, you know, this is a bird that's smaller than, you know, your closed fist, and it's flying from way up here at Seal River or across Canada and Alaska all the way down to South America for the winter. And, you know, one part of the journey, they sometimes will fly as many as three days nonstop straight. This tiny bird the size of your fist flying out over the ocean day and night, no place to stop. And it makes that journey all the way south. And it kind of highlights the, the, um, the connections and the fact that, um, you know, in, in a sense, the reason why we're all here at, at COP15, um, we can do our work in our one particular place, but what happens to the future of the Black Bull Warbler will be affected through all the countries of the hemisphere where it goes. So, you know, the stuff that's going on on the fifth floor here about deciding, you know, what needs to be done to protect the land and how to do it um, affects then the implementation like we see here um, in places like the Seal River watershed and the support that we get from governments and, and funders and other places. And so um, it, it is all, all connected. So. Um, the Blackpool Warbler is just one example of that, I think. We have um, projects, as Marshall mentioned, in a number of other places and, and growing rapidly. Um, and another spot that we are working in is um, in this map. Um, you can see kind of the orange um, square there on the south side of Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories where the Dene Nikwe First Nation um, it has been. Um, starting to explore the idea of a um, uh, indigenous protected and conserved area um, in that area, and there was just an announcement last week of support from the from the federal government to um, move forward that that project and to think more about it. And so, um, in 
in uh, 2021, we provided units um, to the Dene Nekwe First Nation and uh, with some support from CEPAW's Northwest Territories and Ducks Unlimited Canada um, to get the projects, the, um, the units out in this very watery area and the, and the Slave River Delta. Um, and again, similar sorts of results um, that you can look at what species are there. In this particular case, they were delayed in getting them out from a, a climate change effect with the severe flooding that happened in 2021 in the Northwest Territory, so they couldn't actually even get the units out till late in the summer, so we didn't get as full a, a survey of what's there, and we have, um, looking forward to analyzing the results that are, we're just getting the card, the, the SD cards back um, from this year's to look at, because they were, they got out earlier, and we'll be finding a lot more species, but, you know, not surprisingly in that very, again, very wetland dominated area, you know, you're finding a lot of species like tundra swans, again, the same sort of map where you can see um, where they, where they were detected and, 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 um, and sort of how frequently the calls were detected and things like the, the Caspian Turn, this very large sort of gull sized turn with a big carrot beak on it um, that, that occurs up there. So um, we, we have another um, project that actually we've been doing for many years with the Poplar River First Nation on the east side of Lake Winnipeg. Um, you know, that's a kind of a, that green triangle showing roughly where it is in Manitoba. Um, it's part of the Pamachuanaki World Heritage Site, a collection of four First Nations who with the Manitoba and Ontario governments have um, formed this um, Pamachuanaki World Heritage Site and protected millions and millions of acres of vast area. And so um, we've been doing a similar sort of project with their guardians um, placing the units out and um, you know, finding a lot of very cool birds, especially in this area, which is part of the southern um, part of the boreal, which is, of course, the most heavily impacted by forestry, uh, oil and gas mining. Um, and this is one of the largest intact blocks of the southern boreal left. So they have um, some species that you only find it more in the southern part of that region. Um, and again, just very early stages, but already, you know, detecting lots of birds that are particularly reliant on the boreal forest for their survival, like some of the ones you see here. Um, and we're actually getting ready to produce a report with them, um, uh, co-publish a report on the birds of that, which we hope will be sort of an ongoing um, series and we'll be doing, I hope, similar things with the Seal River Watershed Alliance and Denny Nequay First Nation and many others as we, as we move forward. A um, Couple of websites here, but then I'll, I'll just turn it over to Stephanie um, from here. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, I just wanted to kind of end off with something kind of, well, first, before I do that, I wanted to share that in some of this work we've been doing, you know, we've been talking to other science people about um, this case for conservation, reasons why we need to do this work, the science reasons, right? And so I'm looking up at these species lists that they have, that they were given to me, and I'm going, there's so much stuff missing. There's so much data missing in these lists. And, and I'm like, hey, you don't have any chickadees on this list. I know there's chickadees there. And they're like, oh, sorry, we don't have any proof that there's chickadees there, right? And I'm like, how, how did my parent, my grandparents or my family give me this name if these birds don't exist, right? So it's really beautiful to be able to pair those, you know, that Western science to the knowledge that we already have and we already know about. But it's also really great that we now have some of this Western science proof to back it up because we can say, we've been telling you guys this for this many years and you've never taken us seriously and you've never taken the words that, the knowledge that we've been trying to share for so long. And, and it's only now that people are starting to listen and starting to hear because we're starting to build this baseline data, right? So it's been really uh, cool to be like, uh, you're missing some stuff here. And then they're going, oh, no, no, we just, we don't have anything that proves it. But now we can, we can bring these lists that we have with these sound recorders. We can say, well, we have this proof, you know. And so I think now we have over 100 species that we're collecting on the, the recorders that we're so excited to share with everybody once we're able to get these reports out. So um, 
it's it's a really beautiful project and it's been really exciting to get our young people out there and our elders you know combining the two talking about sharing the promoting the languages and really um, rebuilding that connection to the land for some of our young people and really encouraging that because that's what's so important for our young people to have a really strong um, future for themselves is they have a really good understanding of where they come from and who they are as Indigenous people. So um, I, w I just want to say thank you so much to the Audubon Society for um, taking this step with us to hear the sounds of our backyards and to celebrate that with us, Masicho. So I guess we can um, probably take a question, if anybody has a question for us. This, yeah. Masi Cho for your presentation. Um, I have so many questions. I'll start just with two. Um, I work for the First Nation Sustainable Institute in Quebec and Labrador, and we're doing a very similar project. Um, but it's for a little bit of a different reason. It's to, we're working with the Canadian Wildlife uh, Service from the Government of Canada, and with uh, local uh, indigenous communities on the north coast of Quebec. And my first question is, um, our big issue with the ARUs was that the porcupines eat the microphones. <laughs> so I don't know if you have also this issue, but uh, it's been like, I was wondering if that happened. We did have some microphone, like the little squishy parts missing, but we weren't really sure what they, we haven't heard any data from Jeff or anybody saying that they've heard little munching or anything. But um, when they maybe we'll have to uh, check those units again because we did notice that there was some like of the squishy parts gone and we couldn't find them anywhere. Um, also, another question. Um, we're using a protocol based on what the government is doing, like science-based and everything. So we're doing um, random places to put the AR ARUs uh, linked to habitat to really have like a broad uh, idea of what's out there in the boreal forest. And I was wondering how do you do that while choosing the places to put the ARU like uh, data wise? How do you compare to like more broader um, inventory of birds? Is this, oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's a good, uh, good question. Um, the way we are looking at it is that there's sort of, um, not to get so too deep into the science part of it, but there's different levels of, um, of, of inference that you can get from different sorts of designs and studies, and there's a, a certain type of information that you can get from, um, you know, putting these units out um, in, in a non-random way. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to go to something where you're trying to establish a certain other kind kinds of information or some kind of way of making it comparative to other places, you know, you can go that route. Um, it involves, as you know from experience, you know, a, a much more a complicated protocol and training, and um, often logistically more expensive. So there's there's ways to do that and that's an option for any first nation as far you know from our perspective if that's a way that they're interested in going that way and we can figure out a way to to find the funding to do it that that's great but a lot of these places um you know there's so little information that anything we find out is is new information so um and it you know um to us it's the idea of it being combined with traditional knowledge in some sense in that way is the maybe the more important part of it. Um, so it depends on the goals of the project, I guess, yeah. Makes sense. Uh, one last question, sorry for taking too much time. Um, I was wondering how do you um, engage the youth to get them excited about birds? Because birds is usually not a very sexy subject for many youth. So, like, we've been really having issues to recruit youth in the communities, even though we're working with the communities to, like, do this project. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, we haven't really had to, like, be creative. It's 
these kids want to get on the land, you know, and they want to, um, it's just that exposure that they really need. And, and even just showing them some of these things that they could be doing is exciting them, you know, like, uh, we were able to partner with Parks Canada last year to get some youth to this 4 in one youth camp happening in Churchill. And Darren, who you saw in the photo, he was able to learn from them some of the bird watching stuff that they do. He learned about a field guide book and a waterproof and a pencil and all this like stuff that you need, right? And so we were talking about doing this work and going and p picking up the units and starting to do some work with the Audubon Society. Instantly, he knew I need these supplies. I learned that I got that we need to do this stuff, and I'm going to need a tripod so I can get really good photos if I see anything out there. And he, so he was already, he he knew. Like I didn't even have to. Just that exposure is what's giving them, um, I guess, a little bit of hope to be able to do more because there isn't a lot in these communities, and it's really remote, and they don't have a lot uh, to think about. You know, like when I graduated, there was only two of us in. The, my class who graduated and so there there isn't a lot of opportunities um so that's why this sort of work is so exciting is because we're creating opportunities for ourselves that are going to stay there as opposed to in the past these science projects come in they do the work they hire us to be boat drivers and then they leave they don't share the data with us. We don't know what's going on there. We don't know what's the result of all of the tissue sampling that they've been doing. Should we be alarmed? Should we be sharing that with our people who are harvesting these animals to eat? We have no idea, right? So that's what's so important and empowering about these kinds of projects is because we get to build these jobs for ourselves and they'll be we can have them recurring and they can build careers, real careers for themselves as land users, which is something that's unheard of. You know, usually land users are trappers or they're on uh, social assistance because they want to be connected to the land, right? Whereas now we can say you can build a real career for yourself doing this work and that's so exciting. And we're starting to see them post on social media, I will be a guide. You know, like, or I will do these jobs, these land guardians jobs, because they believe it, because they know that's what fits them. Whereas before, these jobs never existed, right? And so to see that little spark of hope start to happen, it really makes everything worth it. It makes doing 10 presentations worth it. It makes sharing this many times with all of you people what life is like in our communities worth it, because if it brings more opportunities to them, then we're doing a really good job for them because it's that generation that needs that support. Thank you very much. I, I, feel like I'm <laughs> I think we have one more question we could do. All right, thanks, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Brian Banks, a writer here with Canadian Geographic at the conference. I just wanted to sort of maybe follow up on your comment about the importance of, of the data and having the data. You mentioned a couple of days ago the feasibility study f f was announced with the governments of Manitoba and, and Canada. And I just wanted to ask, you know, just what role this kind of science and data gathering plays in, in you know, develop, you know, going forward on, on the whole big project. Yeah, so we really tried to put the Indigenous knowledge first and foremost in the work that we're doing, as always, that's what matches us, right? Uh, but we do understand that we need to um, pair some of that. You need to kind of have a little bit of both in today's worlds that we exist in, right? So the feasibility study, we're not sure exactly all of the contents of that yet. That hasn't been decided. It needs to be a decision made by our four chiefs, the leadership, and uh, nation to nation to nation, right? For the province and Canada. So uh, once we have those discussions, we'll be able to really say exactly what kind of sciencey stuff needs to be in there. But at the forefront, we've done so much work ahead of time. So we have all of this homework that we're so excited to bring to the tables of these, uh, these um, policy makers and to say, you know, we've done this work. We already know about some of this stuff. So, but here's our indigenous knowledge. Here's the th three, over 300 surveys we've conducted, elders knowledge, elders information and teachings that is going to kind of start that work.
Masicho, everybody, for coming and listening and um, doing kind of celebrating some of the young people with us. Um, I know that we also are really happy that you're here and we have a gift for some of you. So if some of you guys want to just check under your chair, there might be a sticker under your chair. And if there is, we have some things to give away. We got one. Keep checking. We have eight gifts. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Marshall, not for you. So Liana here, uh, our friend, she has sweaters to give away. And I also have one uh, thermos, one uh, coffee thermos. So whoever wants the thermos can come and grab the thermos. And then the rest are hoodies. Thank you so much, Masicho, everybody.